So, after what has felt like weeks of leaks, today the Prime Minister finally wielded his axe on the northern leg of HS2, addressing the Conservative conference in Manchester. Rishi Sunak confirmed what we had reported earlier this week and he delivered a new phrase, Network North. But that wasn't all. The PM also set out plans for a new post-16 qualification and to increase the smoking age. Our political editor, Beth Rigby, reports from Manchester. All this week, Conservative conference has been trying to come to terms with the leader they didn't vote for. This a PM who's been battered from the fringe sidelines and beset by leaks preempting what he needs to be a game-changing speech. <laughs> Pulling out all the stops in the most personal of ways, this the first PM introduction by a political spouse since 2009. Rishi and I are each other's best friends. This is a reset for her as much as him, thanks to difficult coverage around Mrs Murty's tax affairs last year. This a couple now in election mode, his slogans now hers. Rishi, you know this. You know that doing the right thing for the long term, even when it's hard, is the right thing to do. This a scene from a presidential playbook. This a prime minister making a personal pitch. My story is a British story. A story about how a family can go from arriving here with little to Downing Street in three generations. Now, I am proud to be the first British Asian prime minister. But you know what? I'm even prouder that it's just not a big deal. <laughs> Today, all about connecting with voters, and it moved his education secretary to tears in the room. A speech as much about where he came from as where he wants to go next. HS2 is the ultimate example of the old consensus. Mr Sunak modelling himself as a reformer ready to take tough decisions. High-speed rail to the north, the first casualty. I am ending this long-running saga. I am cancelling the rest of the HS2 project. And in its place, we will reinvest every single penny, £36 billion pounds in hundreds of new transport projects in the North and the Midlands across the country. The PM delighted to have got it off his chest. Announcements too on smoking with the legal age being raised by a year every year and big reform in education, a new qualification system for 16 to 19-year-olds in England. <laughs> and plenty of politics too. Godin Keir Starmer. He is the walking definition of the 30-year political status quo I am here to end. <laughs> and trying to take Labour into culture war territory. And we shouldn't get bullied into believing that people can be any sex they want to be. They can't. A man is a man and a woman is a woman. That's just common sense. What's going on here is this is a Prime Minister behind in the polls asking you to take another look at him. All week he's been trying to connect with the party. This was a message to the country as he goes in to the fight of his political life. Alex, hello. hello. What did you make of the speech? Did I, he do what he needed I to do? It was bold, it was decisive, it's visionary, it's taking tough decisions. I thought it was a really important speech and it's one that puts this country on a course to a better future. So I, look, I thought it was amazing. Do you think he's going to be able to get the public to give him another look now? I hope so, and I think from what I've seen, there was a lot there which is really inspirational. But key components of the PM's new Northern network, in reality a rehash of previous Tory plans postponed or cancelled. The Prime Minister just delivered to the, deliver the Northern Powerhouse Rail in full, which runs uh, through Bradford. The Chancellor canned this in the integrated rail plan. The two, yes, so the, canned it. yes, we have, because his judgment is... And then the, you're putting money the into projects he cancelled. The government's judgment is the £36 billion that we were going to spend on HS2 is better spent different transport connections across the north of England, east to west. Talking about the long term, but this all about driving his short-term political prospects up. A man in a hurry. Beth Rigby, Sky News, Manchester.
Uh, well, there's a new phrase today, Network North. Uh, that's what the Prime Minister is calling the list of projects he reeled off earlier, saying that they're a much better use of the money that HS2 would have cost. So we can take a look at some of the projects he announced. Well, the high-speed link from Birmingham to Euston will be completed, but the London station will be scaled back to reduce costs. The Manchester to Birmingham leg of HS2, that's now going, along with the HS2 East leg. The £12 billion line between Manchester and Liverpool, that will go ahead. The Prime Minister re-announcing a number of projects, including the electrification of the Trans-Pennine route, the building of the Midlands Rail Hub and a tram system for Leeds. Sunak also promised a new electrified line between Hull and Manchester. So what's driven today's announcement? In one word, cost. Back in 2015, it was thought that HS2 would cost £55 billion, but now it's thought that the budget had almost doubled. So, do people and businesses believe they're going to be better off under this new network north? Our business correspondent Paul Kelso has been finding out. In Manchester, only the trams were running. A strike shut the railways for a day, while inside a former station, the trains of the future were cancelled by a Prime Minister promising local links in place of HS2. I am disgusted, but I'm, I'm, I'm not... This, whatever the Tories do, does it surprise me? Well, I think he'd better do it, yeah. He needs improvement. I was waiting about 20 minutes for the bus this morning, never come. It's sad and perhaps entirely unsurprising that it's the Manchester part that gets cancelled. From the leaders who want high-speed rail to transport investment and opportunity north, there was fury. It does not deliver that new line. It involves patching up existing lines and leaving us uh, with a problem that still has not been fixed. So it doesn't work east-west, but nor does it work north-south either. Businesses like this were counting on a high-speed boost. They make clean air units for the pharmaceutical industry. Watching the PM, the boss turned it blue. I do feel like second-class citizens, but I guess if I'm in Leeds, if I'm in Liverpool, if I'm up in Scotland, I feel equally the same. It's like nothing exists past, past London. And how the hell somebody can come up to the heartland and say, oh, by the way, we're now going to chop you off. That's fantastic marketing. HS2 will now end in Birmingham with a link to the West Coast main line, but it will now extend to Euston. A proposed £12 billion fast link from Liverpool to Manchester survives, enabling faster east-west travel. And the line to Hull will be electrified, all part of the third rail plan for the north in as many years. In place of HS2, Rishi Sunak's promising more of this, better local transport links. And they'll doubtless be welcome, but it's less than two years since the government was promising it could do it all. And much of what he's promised isn't even new. So he may find that breaking the promise of high-speed rail to the north comes at a price in trust, in the time it takes to deliver these projects, and in the credibility of any infrastructure plan put forward by his government. I just can't believe it. This decision will cause chaos along the route where families like the Froggarts have endured compulsory purchase orders for land that may never be used. The £36 billion pounds that Rishi Sunak has announced is going to be spent on other levelling up projects in the north, which I think is wonderful. Can he just tell us or give us some clarity on how much money is going to be allocated in repairing the devastation and the work that HS2 have already done? The government says the sell-off of HS2 land will begin soon, but Mr Sunak still needs the support of his northern MPs to get his plan through Parliament before an election that could yet put HS2 back on track. Paul Kelso, Sky News in Manchester. Uh, well, the Prime Minister has announced plans which will effectively ban young people from smoking. Rishi Sunak wants to raise the smoking age by one year every year, meaning someone who is 14 today will never be legally allowed to buy cigarettes. Uh, Mr Sunak isn't criminalising smoking, meaning that those who already smoke will remain free to do so. But he says the policy could phase out smoking in young people almost completely. Uh, well, joining me is one of the presenters of our news programme for young people, Braden Bent. Uh, Braden, uh, the PM said that this would mean a 14-year-old today will never legally be sold a cigarette and that they and their generation can grow up smoke free. Uh, what have you and your mates made about this today? Well, I think for me, cigarettes isn't really a major problem amongst young people. And as you've said, 
14 year olds and younger, so myself will never be able to buy a cigarette. And I, to be honest, I support it because I unfortunately lost a family member due to smoking related illness. Um, and I know how bad smoking is really. It costs the NHS, it's bad for our health. It's got a negative impact on you know the family members like myself. It was sad because I almost knew it was coming through smoking. So if you're asking, am I happy to be part of a smoke-free generation if it was to go through Parliament? Yeah, I think I am. Yeah, I mean, when you put it like that, is this generation, your generation, interested in smoking anyway? I mean, we've heard about changing attitudes towards alcohol, for instance, amongst young people, smoking as well. Has the Prime Minister sort of targeted it wrong? He did mention vapes today and tougher rules on those. Uh, should that be the focus, do you think? I think if you're talking about issues amongst young people, yeah, I think vaping is a bigger problem than smoking cigarettes. I mean, I did a documentary called FY Investigates Kids Who Vape. Mm. And basically what, what, what that was doing was finding, you know, why are young people vaping and how many of us are doing it? And it's crazy, really. I do believe that the biggest, fact, the biggest issue, let's say, amongst young people is vaping and not smoking cigarettes. And I feel that maybe something more needs to be done on vaping if you're going towards young people. OK, Braden, really good to get your point of view. Braden Bent there from FYI, our uh, news programme for younger people reacting to that uh, ban on smoking in Britain in all but name. It's our debate coming up a little later in the programme. You can scan the QR code on your screen right now to get involved and have your say. Plenty of you getting in touch on social media already. We're asking if this smoking ban is the nanny state at work or if the government is actually doing the right thing in the name of the nation's health. Send us your thoughts. We'll include some of them in our debate coming up at around 8.30 tonight. And now, Sky News understands that Metro Bank, one of the 10, 10th largest banks in Britain, is drawing up plans to raise hundreds of millions of pounds in a bid to strengthen its balance sheet. Our city editor, Mike Kleinman, uh, broke the story and has more details. What does this mean for people watching at home tonight, Mark? Well, Sarah Jane, at the moment, it doesn't necessarily mean that much. Metro Bank is a significant player in the British high street banking sector. It's got about 2.7 million customers and that was from a standing start after the last financial crisis it only opened its first branch uh, less than 13 years ago so it's built its uh, presence across the industry uh, pretty quickly and the reason though that it needs to raise this significant sum of new capital is that it's been no stranger uh, to financial difficulty during that relatively uh, brief history so Metro Bank has been fined by regulators uh, during the last decade uh, for misleading investors and it's struggled at times to uh, keep pace with its own uh, expansion. It's got a very expensive branch network. Now, as I understand it, it needs to raise uh, a couple hundred million pounds by selling new shares to investors and it also needs to raise uh, a significant sum in new debt. The, the difficulty it's going to face, Sarah Jane, is that Metro Bank's share price has fallen by over 95% since its peak in 2018. At that point, it was worth three and a half billion pounds. It's now worth less than a hundred million pounds and that's going to make um, executing or delivering this new capital raising quite tricky and I suppose the reason that this is significant is that we haven't seen uh, any major retail banks other than the co-op bank over the last decade getting into trouble but I understand that the uh, financial regulators are watching this situation at Metro Bank uh, very closely and it will be interesting to see over the coming weeks uh, whether it succeeds in getting this capital raising away. So much. Now, uh, Lawrence Fox has been sacked by GB News. This is after comments he made about a female journalist last week. Uh, what's more, the former actor was arrested today on suspicion of conspiring to damage London's new ULES cameras. Our correspondent Katie Spencer is here with more details. Sacked and then arrested. It's been quite the day for Lawrence Fox. Even by Lawrence Fox standards, it's quite a day of extremes, isn't it, really? Um, starting with the sacking, shall we? Lawrence mm. Fox predicted last week that this was coming. We know, of course, Ofcom have had now over 8,800 complaints made about that deeply misogynistic rant that he went on on the Dan Wooten show on GB News, completely unchallenged by Dan Wooten, of course, where he spoke about what, what self-respecting man would climb into bed with a, a journalist who was on 
on a, a, a rival broadcaster. It caused a huge outrage, widespread people coming out to, to criticise him over that. He thought he, he did, to an extent, apologise for what he said, but he predicted that he was going to be sacked. And today, that has happened. GB News confirming just after lunch that they've concluded their internal investigation and taken the decision to terminate the contract of both him and a fellow presenter, Calvin Robinson. Now, Calvin Robinson's an interesting one because he was actually nothing to do with that original debate. Um, his uh, crime, if you like, was actually daring to sort of put a tweet out about the bosses being vaguely critical and saying that Dan Wooten uh, should be kept on and it would be unfair if he was dismissed. Now, Dan Wooten, we still don't know the outcome of his internal investigation. That's still so, ongoing. Yeah, yeah, we're still going to be waiting to find out what that one is. But, yeah, I think the bosses at GB News, really, the, the heat on this story wasn't going away, so they had to be seen to act. As you say, though, as well today for Lawrence Fox, we had him tweeting videos at the start of the day in true Lawrence Fox fashion, smoking a cigar, surrounded by police officers, making this sort of outspoken rant on social media about how he was about to be arrested. So shall we take yeah, a look at it? I think it's worth having a look at. The um, ULES scam cameras outside of London are a complete... The outer ULES zone is a complete scam. There's no scientific evidence. Sadiq Khan rubbished the evidence and had it rewritten to serve his own needs. No one voted it. It's the beginning and bringing in of a surveillance state. And he's trying to make noises so that I can't say that. It's the beginning of a surveillance state and these boys are the Stasi. Sadiq Stasi. Bless him. So have a lovely day. I'm going to spend my day in the clink. There you have it. Lawrence Fox finding out the hard way today that there are real-world consequences to some of the things that he has to say. OK, Katie, thank you. Um, Katie, you're going to be interested in this next interview because I'm encroaching on your territory a bit here, <gasps> arts and entertainment, uh, and I know you, that uh, <laughs> you follow uh, the career of this next person and her family. Over the past two decades, one American family has had a huge impact on popular culture globally, particularly here in the UK. The Kardashians became the most fa famous family on the planet from their reality TV show and their savvy use of social media. They are a billion-dollar female dynasty that has inspired a whole generation to strive to do the same. Well, Caitlyn Jenner uh, was there for it all, and she is part of a new Sky documentary, House of Kardashian, that shows you how they did it without the glossy filters. All the Jenners are here. At that time, we were making the best of the opportunities that came in. I think we could be the most colorful family out there, don't you? We were just looking for work. Whatever it is, we'll do it. And no, you I had friends of mine who, whenever they were with me, would say, you guys are a reality show. And I would go, oh, don't be so silly. And then I started thinking, maybe we should try this reality show business. And we all know what happened next. Well, I caught up with Caitlin earlier on today. We spoke about her family's impact on popular culture and also how the toxicity that surrounded her very public transition saw her go from trans activist to what she calls a trans example. It's been a long journey, um, extremely successful journey, especially for the kids. And uh, I couldn't be proud, more proud of them. That's why in this series, um, I think it's real interesting to watch that progression and kind of how this all happened and where they're at today. What we see in this docu-series is where it all started before the cameras started rolling, essentially, with Keeping Up With The Kardashians, yeah. and you and Chris becoming the original influencers, if you like, with yeah. infomercials in the 90s. Right. Chris tapped into that. She knew that was something. And then on it went reality TV, you know, social media titans in terms of the most followers on Instagram and so on and the business empire they created. Looking back on it now, you know, there is a lot of criticism running through the documentary. I mean, there's no stone unturned. It's not like a, a rose-tinted view of everything. And exactly. Yes, yes, we go through a lot. When you look at what has been created, do you think it's good or bad? Because I think there's an interview with um, Kim in the documentaries that asked that question, is what they created good or bad? Well, we live in America where our dreams can come true mm -hmm. if you work hard, if you're smart. Um, you can, even if you start with nothing, but you've got good ideas and you're willing to work. I remember Kimberly a couple of months ago uh, she was kind of getting fed up with a lot of these young people that are growing up and really don't want to work, and, but they all want fame and they all want to be on Instagram and have a lot of followers and all that sort of stuff. And, um, 
And Kimberly, because of her success, she said, look, at it, that, that's, you know, how do you get to where I'm at? Mm -hmm. You get up in the morning really early and you go to work mm -hmm. and you work all day long and you're really smart. And then when you get home, you get some sleep and you go back the next day and you work again. You work. That's how you get here. It's incredible. It did spawn, it's incredible. It did spawn a whole movement and a whole generation who, like you said, wanted to be famous for being famous. Like you said, the girls talked about the hard work that goes on behind it. But right. people wanted to be on reality TV. They wanted to have, you know, millions of Instagram followers. What would you say, what advice would you give to parents whose children, when you say, what do you want to be when you grow up, say, I want to be a YouTuber or I want to be famous. I wonder if you have any regrets about what happened to your family and if you could offer any advice. I don't have any regrets with my family. Why? Because they know how to handle it. They've been doing this since the beginning, I mean, for a long time. Um, and they've had the highs, they've had the lows. Uh, they've learned a lot. They, they know more than I do. I mean, they're out there all the time. They're very sharp. So. Uh, and because of that, uh, they've built tremendous businesses. Um, you know, Kylie, who I had no idea. I mean, she always had this fascination with uh, with makeup. And uh, when they st we started the show, Kylie, I think, was nine. Kendall was 10 or eight, nine and 10, somewhere right around there. And Chris and I decided they were going to put everything that they made until they're 18 in a trust. And so everything went there. So when the girls turned 18, uh, they had a nice little nest egg of you know years of working and all put away for them. They did rather well, didn't they? Because one's a supermodel and now one's a billionaire. So you must be extremely proud of your girls. Well, I got two billionaires right now. <laughs> and I think the third one's probably on the on way. On their way, three billionaires. Yes, yes, they're creeping in. I can't tell you which one, that, but yeah. Uh, very, <laughs> I'm sure very close. sure can hazard a guess. Yeah, and, and they've been yeah, extraordinarily successful. Mm. New rules with the World Athletics um, ban on trans women competing in women's events, cycling, right. doing something similar, swimming, creating a separate right. event for trans women, but nobody wanted to compete in that event. Where do you stand on trans women being in sport? And it's such a mess. What do you think is needed to sort it out? Because it's become really the toxic. Only thing, the only thing you can do, I have been very clear on this subject for the last couple of years. Uh, from the Leah Thomas thing, you know, back in the in the U.S. Um, and uh, in swimming, um, trans women sh trans women should not be competing in women's sports. Bottom line. If you'd have transitioned when you I were have at the been height of your career, what would you have done? Do you think? I, I never would have done that. I no. wouldn't. No, I, I never would have. You got to real. I have to. I realize that if you're going through a transition, you're going through that. There's some things you can do and some things you can't do. Okay, you got to. You can't say, I am not this trans person that goes, I am a woman and, you know, everybody else just quiet down, you know, and you better use the right pronouns. And I am not that, okay? I'm not even close to that, okay? Uh, I am a young person. I'm, I'm a person that suffered from gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is real, okay? It is real. And it needs to be treated in your own way, but it's very small. There's very few people in the country that really are truly gender dysphoric. And, uh, but um, I suffered with it my whole life. My, if, you, if you had a chance to read my book, Secrets of My Life by Caitlyn Jenner. I know, it's from, from being a, a small and child. And I go through the whole thing, the sneaking around, the lying, the behind closed doors, everything. And uh, I suffered with this my whole life. I raised families and suffered with it, and on and on and on. And I finally got to the point in my life with dealing with gender dysphoria, that here I was like 65 years old, I had done this my whole life, that um, I, I'm sick and tired of this, you know? I got, I got to live my life. All my kids are raised, everything's been done. Uh, now look, I've never seen the Kardashians reality TV series, but we've all heard of them, right? And that's kind of the point. This documentary poses some really interesting questions about this generation's desire to be famous and at what cost. Are the Kardashians the ultimate example of feminism and female empowerment, or do they actually represent no more than commercialism and superficiality? The point was made in the documentary that they didn't speak out on Me Too from a position of huge influence because it wouldn't be on brand. Love them or loathe them, their tale is very much a mirror 
to modern popular culture. The documentary, a really interesting watch. Uh, still to come on the UK tonight, the moment it all went wrong. Dash cam footage of two drug dealers, rather relaxed attempts to evade the police. By the men's European Championships, looks set for a return to the UK, with Ireland getting in on the act as well. Plus... Warm memories, wherever you go. A perfect night for Ed Sheeran in Ipswich. I'm Mark Stone and I'm sc correspondent based here in Washington, D.C. Oh, street. Oh, street. Well, the plan seems to be to head to the police station where the policeman who fired the shots was based. And everything you know is memories is all gone. In almost every corner, this town has been completely destroyed by the fire. I've witnessed the remarkable passion for politics here, but the anger too. Trump out of the White House. Is this the moment to reform gun laws? You know, it's, it's easy to go to politics. But it's important. It's at the heart of the issue. I, I get that that's where the media likes to go. No, it's not. It's where many of the people we've talked to here like to go. I report on the biggest stories from around the world. This is a town that is effectively encircled by the Russians. You say it's all fabrication, what's happening in Butcher. Destroyed my nation. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our planet. Oh, yeah, I can hear now quite a few explosions uh, in the distance here in Jerusalem. A very violent series of confrontations here. What do you think of ISIS? Everybody here know the truth of ISIS. Stage, the film and TV podcast. Uh, hello, welcome back. You are watching the UK tonight. Here's what's coming up. Uh, nanny state at work or protecting children. We'll be debating Rishi Sunak's plan to raise the smoking age by one year every year, which effectively bans smoking for the next generation. You can get in touch with your thoughts by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. And we'll be trying to find out why young adults are leaving Wales and what the government needs to do to keep them there. Right, we're going to take a look at some of the other stories making news in the UK tonight. First, the story of a teenage soldier, Royal Artillery Gunner Jaisley Beck, who took her own life after she was subjected to relentless sexual harassment by her boss. Well, police have launched an investigation after inquiry found that Jaisley Beck had been subjected to months of coercive control and stalking. The 19-year-old was found dead at Larkhill Camp in Wiltshire in December 2021. The Army report into her death, published today, describes an intense period of unwelcome behaviour, saying it is almost certain that this was a causal factor in her death. Our Chief North of England correspondent, Greg Milan has been speaking to Jaisley's mum. Could tell that she she was concerned about what he was capable, possibly capable of doing. I'm kind of left feeling angry and not able to maybe say a great deal. Who's listening to us? This report's gone out. Is it 
you know, is it us against the military? And it shouldn't be. This is our daughter. We knew her. We knew her. We, to the point that it was us that um, raised our concerns to the military um, on our daughter's final day. You think more needs to be done? Sadly, I don't feel that it's, there is enough support for soldiers. Northumbria police have launched a murder investigation after a 54-year-old man died following a dog attack. Ian Langley was attacked in Chinny Row near Sunderland last night and died in hospital. A 44-year-old man, initially arrested on suspicion of wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm, has been re-arrested on suspicion of murder. The dog, believed to be an XL bully, was shot by police. A corporate manslaughter investigation has begun after nurse Lucy Letby was convicted of murder. The 33-year-old, you will remember, was sentenced to a whole life order for murdering seven babies and attempting to kill six others at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Well, Cheshire Constabulary says it's now going to consider the actions and decision-making of the hospital's senior leadership to decide if any criminality took place. And two drug dealers have come unstuck in Cardiff by trying to get away from police by reversing up a busy road. This is dash cam footage from one of the police cars involved, capturing the moment that the men tried to make off. Drugs and cash were seized when the two men were arrested. Uh, this happened in August. The pair have since been jailed. Still to come on the UK tonight. We'll find out why more young people are leaving Wales than arriving and what the government are going to do to try and stop it. And after the break, Nanny State at Work, a crucial public health move. We'll discuss Rishi Sunak's plans to raise the smoking age, which effectively bans young people from ever buying cigarettes.
And let's get more now on the PM's plans to effectively ban young people from smoking. Rishi Sunak said he wants to raise the smoking age by one year every year, which means someone of the age of 14 today will never be able to legally buy cigarettes. So, tonight we're asking, is this the nanny state at work? Or is the Prime Minister right to prevent something so harmful to our health? That is our debate tonight. Uh, we're joining us to talk about it. Hazel Cheeseman, Deputy Chief Executive of Action on Smoking and Health, and writer and academic Andrew Tettenborn. Um, good evening to you both. Thank you very much for joining us here on the UK tonight. Andrew, I'll come to you first. I spoke to a 14-year-old, Braden, uh, on the show earlier on, and he said... It sounds good, but actually, my generation, me and all my mates, aren't even interested in smoking. So it didn't really sound like Rishi Sunak was introducing a policy that, you know, was bang on the money. Well, that, of course, is one reason why Rishi Sunak thought he was safe in introducing it, because he clearly had at the back of his mind that most young people don't smoke and won't be affected. And most old people, and, and will be affected, most older people won't be affected and do smoke. Mm. Um, I still think, actually, this is a much bigger deal than it looks. Um, I'm not quite sure when it's happened before that government has said to a large section of the British people, here is a pleasure which people have indulged in for, what, 100, 120, 150 years, which has formed part of our society, innumerable films, books, and so on, which we're now going to say that you're never going to be allowed to indulge in. I think it, that's a rather worrying extension of governmental reach. I'm equally not too happy about governments saying to people, essentially... Uh, we are now going to use the law to dictate that you lead a healthy lifestyle. And you, one other thing you've got to remember, there's a large element of class in this. Most smokers these days, not everybody, but most smokers these days are decent working people that just about managing class. People who have to juggle school, home, children and a million other things. Um, who actually do very much appreciate uh, being able to take out the odd silk cut in order yeah, but, to but calm they, their But you've nerves. pointed out that they won't be affected because, you know, it's the next generation that this ban, if it comes into force, will affect. Those people who are already smoking now will be unaffected. So it will just become something where... You know, they might have another vice or habit. Smoking just, just wait won't and, be an just option. Wait. If they don't just know, how could they miss it or feel 30. robbed of it? Just wait until they're 30 with a young family and see whether they think the same way. I rather <laughs> doubt whether they will. And, of course, you've also got... What, 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 I'm, what I'm getting at is that as it, most um, smokers are, I think, they're just about managing people. Hmm. A great many of the anti-smokers are increasingly the urban Prosecco class, who wouldn't be de seen dead smoking themselves, slightly despise the kind of person who smokes and have no compunction about telling them the kind of lifestyle they ought to be living. Anyway, I, I see I what you're getting at much. there. Prose Prosecco is a vice for some people, smoking a vice for others, but, you know, one looks like it's going to be bad and one isn't, and you could argue both are bad for your health. Um, Hazel, I want to bring in your view on this. Um, you know, I was just saying that the Prime Minister is perhaps targeting the wrong people. The generation coming up are, are, are shunning smoking. They're probably not, you know, going out and drinking alcohol anymore. It's the ones who are smoking now that are the health issue for the UK. And this isn't going to touch them at all. Well, I think what the, the government's sort of big splashy headline today has been about raising the age of sale. But behind the scenes, they've also doubled the investment to stop smoking services and increased the investment in enforcing the tobacco related laws that we have. And um, uh, we'll be raising the amount of money that they're going to spend on motivating people to stop smoking. And all of that together is really important because, yes, we have declining rates of smoking. Yes, we have uh, fewer young people starting than ever before. But smoking remains the leading cause of preventable death. And it is, as um, Andrew has pointed out, really concentrated in disadvantaged populations. It's completely outrageous to suggest that we should be complacent about the, the burden of poor health the burden of poverty which smoking causes um, in the most disadvantaged parts of society. 
And if we can get people not to start smoking, that is ideal. Because it's a nonsense to say if they get to 30, they'll miss a cigarette. Nobody is starting smoking at the age of 30. Absolutely, almost every smoker has started by the time they're 20. So but this I suppose is what a, Andrew's saying is it's taking away someone's choice. It's taking away someone's choice. And should the well, government be allowed to do that? For instance, well, at, you know, at he at made moment, a point where people thing... drink Prosecco. If the government said we're going to start to phase out alcohol and add on it a year every year, when you get to 30, you might think, oh, you know, I fancy a glass of Prosecco. Do you see what I mean? It's just taking away a choice, which is what Andrew's getting at. Should I mean, that tobacco, be allowed? Tobacco is not the same as alcohol. And as I say, nobody starts smoking as an adult. It is something that people start as teenagers. And, mm. it, and the question of well, choice is an interesting true. one. I started I... smoking as an adult. I started, I don't do it any longer, but I started smoking as an adult. There are plenty of people who do. They may marry someone who smokes. I just, I just don't think you can say that. And well, there's statistics. Admit, I think Ash has a pretty clear saying that um, we don't want to be complacent and increase the poverty of the just about managing classes when they're also advocating putting up the price of the cigarettes, which those people rely on to keep themselves calm. So well, let's, uh, let's bring in some. Let's quickly bring in some viewer comments sorry. here because a lot of people getting in touch on social media about this. Um, let's um, bring in Ben. Ben says, "Ban selling it, not buying it." If you're really about banning anything, Tom Sanger says, "People are going to smoke if they want to. Banning it only encourages black market sales of non-regulated products." Yeah. If it's kept available, it's kept controlled and to a specific standard. Uh, but some of you think this is a good idea. And Nano uh, says it's definitely the right decision. No part of smoking is good for the body or mind. And Scotsman in Bulgaria says 1,000% uh, yes, ban cigarettes altogether will save thousands of lives. Um, Andrew, just one of, the, one of the things that was brought up in that is about if there is a ban on cigarettes, they'll just go bootleg, go underground. And this is the kind of discussion that is being had around recreational drugs. Are we in danger of getting into that territory, do you think? I think we are very much so. Well, some I think very nearly 20% of all the fags sold in this country are already uh, underground. And, um, well, I wouldn't dream of, of suggesting any of you might remember this, but 100 years ago, or just over 100 years ago, the United mm -hmm. States introduced prohibition, which was actually introduced by very much the same ideas as the present ban, or the idea of a ban on cigarettes. It was a progressive cause. It was for public health. It was for the benefit of the public. We all know that the result of that disastrous 13 mm. years between 1920 and 1933 was okay. Al Capone and his merry men. We're going to see an enormous amount more of that okay. if we end up going down the New Zealand route and banning cigarettes. OK, Andrew, a, a final thought from you, Hazel, if I may. I mean, the stats are pretty clear. Um, smoking causes around one in four cancer deaths and 64,000 in England alone, costing the economy and the and wider society £7 billion uh, pounds each year. It's not just the the cost in terms of cash, it's the cost in terms of the effect on lives. Um, Braden, the 14-year-old I spoke to earlier, said, you know, he lost a relative um, because of cancer co caused by smoking. And that's really the wider effect. It's not just those who pick up the cigarettes themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I attended a funeral last year of a, of a, a, a Conservative councillor who was in her 40s with grandchildren when she died. And that's the cost of smoking the true cost of smoking is the funerals the 64,000 funerals that are avoidable in this country every year and it, it is a needless you know it's not a product that is is conferring any benefit to society the only people that are benefiting from the sale of tobacco in this country are the tobacco companies and okay. you know we can do without them okay hazel cheeseman have and you, if you have never smoked i can tell you smoking gives pleasure and a large number of smokers, a large number of smokers say so. OK, smoking gives pleasure, but we do know it is bad for your health. OK, Andrew and Hazel, thank you very much. Disagreeing on that debate, but that's something really interesting that Rishi Sunak uh, brought out in his speech earlier, this potential ban in all but name on smoking. Now, young people from every generation have felt the urge to leave home and move to the big city. But in Wales, it's a bigger problem than ever before. 
with most regions seeing more young adults leave the area than come in. Our correspondent, Dan Whitehead, has been speaking to young people to find out why they left Wales and if they're going to return. Across Wales, an exodus is underway. Young people are leaving, crossing the border in search of opportunity. Among them, 21-year-old Serien. She's studying less than 30 miles from Wales in Gloucester and doesn't see herself returning anytime soon. I feel like in Wales, there's very, it's very much like one type of job or not a large variety. It's like you either work in like a shop or like in an office. I like to come back to Wales and, you know, cos, like you said, it's like my home, but it's, you've got to be realistic about things and if Wales doesn't make sense, then you can't force it to fit. Serien is among a growing number of young Welsh looking elsewhere to build their lives. Between 2011 and 2021, the population of Wales rose just 1.4%, significantly lower than all other UK nations, with England at 6.6% growth. But it's the drop in young people that's particularly worrying the Welsh Government, with nearly 60% of areas in Wales seeing a fall in those aged 18 to 29. Powys in mid Wales had the biggest drop, down 2.6%. While many in rural Wales head south to Cardiff for work, it's not enough. 24-year-old Kieran is from Newport and studied law in the Welsh capital, but he's moved to London to work in AI. Unfortunately, I don't think as a government we're probably capitalising enough with these kind of booming technological hubs that you find in, say, Manchester and London at the moment. Those things just aren't present in Cardiff. A lack of housing, job opportunities and lower wages are all part of the problem as to why there's a brain drain going on here in Wales. And they are all issues that the Welsh Government insists it is addressing to try and keep the young here. You'll be able to hear it, that's, that's it, right. yeah. In Powys, the Health Board is funding three-year nursing degrees. The scheme is only open to locals and guarantees them a job at the end. So we've had to think a little bit differently about how we actually attract and retain our staff. So by doing this and offering this, it just gives the people in powers, you know, our, our school leavers or, or anybody actually looking for a career in nursing, an opportunity to actually do it and stay at home. For many young people, though, staying at home is not the answer in what is a growing problem in this nation. Dan Whitehead, Sky News in South Wales. Coming up on the UK tonight in the sport, football's coming home. The UK and Ireland primed to host Euro 2028. Love all the latest for Darmish here in the studio next. And a perfect night for Ed Sheeran in Ipswich. First of all, um, Dal, I'll come to you. How would this be useful for police? And presumably there would be strict rules and parameters within which something like this could be used. Uh, that, that would be. Um, in, in terms of how useful it would be, uh, I mean, my passport photo looks nothing like me. Uh, it was taken nine years ago. So, um, so I think there's some practical issues here around the accuracy of uh, images. Um, but I, I think it's important to have checks and balances, but, but uh, it's not unusual for different government agencies to share information to stop fraud, prevent crime, and, and that, that happens already. I think what's important is to have appropriate checks and balances in place. We're against these proposals because they are a really frightening development. It's a huge expansion of the government and the police's ability to spy on us, each and every one of us, as we go about our daily lives. Um, we've seen this time and time again. The government use any social issue of the day to justify uh, an expanded surveillance regime. And I think we have to see it for what it is. It's an attempt to distract us from their own failures in the lead-up to the general election. And the reality is that tech won't solve our societal structural issues and certainly not dodgy tech that is renowned for misidentifying people and will ultimately sweep countless people into the criminal justice system. 
Well, I think Emmanuel's right, and, and, I, and I, I think the difficulty is there is a concern about trust in the police, um, and it's, in fact, trust in the police has never been lower. Uh, it's the lowest level it's uh, ever been, and among certain communities, for example, black communities, um, it's even lower than uh, the, the general community. So, so I understand that concern. I have immense empathy for shop workers that are having to deal with this problem day in and day out, and for people that have been uh, harmed by these issues. But unfortunately, we're being presented with a solution that doesn't even work. We know how this technology is unre unreliable. And of course, people need to be safe at work, in their homes, but a gross invasion of our privacy is, is simply not the answer. I'm Alex Crawford and I'm Sky's special correspondent based in Istanbul. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news. Uh, Darmesh is here with the sport. And we start with good news because, Darmesh, football is coming home in... 2028. <laughs> it could be, yeah. UK and Ireland all set to host Euro 2028. That's after Turkey withdrew from the hosting bidding uh, to concentrate on a joint bid with Italy for 2032. There is a slight issue because the host nation qualifies, but there's five nations, yeah. UK and Ireland, so... That will, have to be, that, that will have to be discussed, but the UEFA Executive Committee meets on Tuesday to ratify the decision that UK and Ireland will indeed be the hosts. OK, and then two years later in 2030, we really are wishing our lives away, aren't we? Uh, the home nations could face a lot of travelling. This is bizarre. It's going to be held in six countries in three different continents, the World Cup. The co-hosts are Spain, Portugal and Morocco, but the opening three games as a mark of 100 years of World Cups... Yeah is going to be in Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay. That means if you're in that group, you could end up playing in Paraguay and then going to Portugal for your second group game. Don't think we've heard the last of it. Yeah, I was going to say, it's one of those plans that probably looks good on paper or on a map, or does it look even worse on paper and on a map? <laughs> I think both. I think both. But, look, from international football to club football, let's get the latest from tonight's Champions League matches.